Hi everyone, welcome to the garage. Homemade, handmade television from the heart. Isn't this beautiful? It's, I don't really like sometimes the way they go and they uh, try to capture an old model and make it new again. But this is a Fiat 500 based on the old Bambina, but it's nippy uh, and it's air conditioned. Why well, couldn't we do the whole show from the car where it's nice and cool? But anyway, um, you remember the original Bambina? It had a crash gearbox and I think a two-stroke engine. But that's great to get around town. Anyway, welcome to the show. Now, if it's in the news, on your mind, close to your heart, getting up your nose or on your chest, it's in the Court of Public Opinion. had a good week and I hope you'll stay and watch the show. We've got some fascinating guests for you to meet in a little while and some of the stories that we take to the streets. Do we have too many public servants? Hmm? Um, animal experimentation in this day and age it's, it's strange to think of animals being put through the suffering that they get put through in the name of safety and comfort for us. Surely there must be a better way. There would have to be. We'll see what you think about animal experimentation. And should charities be more accountable for the money that we give them? In other words, uh, when you give a dollar, should you reasonably ask, how much of this dollar is going to the cause for which I'm giving it, and how much is going to administration? I think you'd get a nasty shock if you got the honest answer. We'll find out what you think on the streets here in the Court of Public Opinion. Uh, last night, I don't know if you saw uh, Q&A on Monday, um, uh, they had Peter Garrett, Minister for Education, and Christopher Pine, who's the Shadow Minister for Education, and they were talking about this new deal, not so much a new deal, but a new process, uh, getting the right people into the classrooms. I don't know if you um, had a particularly wonderful or inspirational teacher. I was blessed. I was really lucky in having a couple of those teachers. They could make an mm, incredible difference to your uh, thirst for knowledge and your... Uh, liking for education. So getting the right teacher, and it's not about money. You know, I, I, I think you can probably throw all sorts of public money at education and all sorts of public money at health, and uh, it'll just be absorbed. But I think this initiative is a good one. Anyone wishing to take on teaching in 2016 would be asked to provide a written statement outlining his or her suitability, good English, as well as undergoing a series of interviews to test whether they have the resilience, and teachers do need resilience, and also the emotional intelligence for the job. I think all of that is good, but it's a priority that really has been neglected. I know that I've said before on my radio show that it was a feeling that I had that teachers were more interested in politics than they were in teaching. But if we can get the right spirit among these people. So in other words, we get the right applicants for those teaching positions. I think we'll be moving ahead wonderfully. Dennis Hood from Family First. He's got some interesting things to say and he'll be right up. I think if I was designing the garage again, uh, I would think to myself, well, maybe up, up this end, which is sort of meant to be my den kind of thing, I could maybe do a television program in there, so wouldn't air conditioning be a good idea? <laughs> Next time. <laughs> Next time. Look, I don't know if you've seen this. Um, that was a full-page ad uh, for this new logo, which was designed in Melbourne. Why wouldn't we have some brilliant people like Ian Kidd, for example? why we'd go to Melbourne. No offence to you Melbourne people, but, you know, um, you did pinch the Grand Prix, remember that. Uh, and then take a whole page in the advertiser, which is probably about $10,000, when what we are supposed to be doing is to promote South Australia. We know it's great. We know it is great. Filled with great, innovative, clever, originating people. What we're trying to do is get people from interstate to uh, grasp that idea. I've looked through all of these wonderful accomplishments. One of the things that they didn't put in was the multifunction polis. Uh, how churlish of me to mention that. 
Dennis Hood from Family First. What do you think of the, um, uh, the logo? Look, Jeremy, I, I think it's... Um I'm not against having a, a symbol for our state as such, but what I am against is the amount of money that it takes to invest in these things. Yeah, 1.3 million and to in, design that. And in fact up to 1.6 I understand when all the on costs are included. So that, that, you know, that's big money. What, the only question I would have is can we use that money better elsewhere? I'm sure we can. Well I'd like to have somebody explain to me how designing a logo could possibly cost a million dollars. Well, you see, they had, had to have a big reveal, didn't they, with all of the celebrities and the, uh, the light show that went with it and all of the song and dance, which really doesn't do anything for anyone other than maybe uh, give some employment to people that are in involved in setting it all up. Mm. I, I just think there's so many things that government do that is unnecessary, and it's, it's the people in the street that end up paying for it indirectly. Yeah. I was listening to you talk to Leon Biner the other morning, and uh, it was about putting the slate down in uh, Rundle Mall. That's right. So w w <laughs> they'll actually be able to do it more cheaply if they ship it from China yeah. instead of a quarry in South Australia? Jeremy, this story really offends me. I mean, what's happening is they're remodelling Rundle Mall. Fine. Okay, uh, that needs to be done from time to time. $30 million, uh, it's, a, it's a big spend. I'm not against that. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, these things need to be rejuvenated. But the pavers for the mall will come from China. Mm. And I just think that's extraordinary. We have some of the highest quality pavers here in the world made in South Australia. Now, now to be fair to the council that's making this decision, it is cheaper to get them to China. That in itself I can't, is beyond belief. The shipping alone. Uh, shipping alone from China to Adelaide is cheaper than driving them from the quarry. It's hard to believe. But the reason for that, of course, is the outrageous taxes and charges that our businesses have to pay here. Now, you run through some of those for me. Sure. We have the highest rates of land tax in Australia. Uh, we have the highest rates of um, many taxes in, Austra in Australia, here in South Australia, but land tax is one of them. I've got a brief list here. Yeah. We have the highest stamp duty in Australia. For instance, the average size small business in South Australia pays $308,000 in tax a year, in total state taxes, compared to the national average of about 285000 so straight away local businesses are at a disadvantage. On top of that, we have the highest power prices in the world here in <laughs> South Australia, we're told. It's a joke, isn't it? It's ridiculous. Absolutely you know, a joke. You know, the average unit of electricity is less than half the cost in Texas than what it is here in South Australia. Then we have the highest carbon tax in the world. Highest carbon tax in the world, $23 a tonne to increase by 5% every single year. Um, over the life of the scheme unless there's a legislative change. So, you know, the, the price of carbon per tonne in Europe at the moment is about $6 a tonne. What genius thought that 23 would be an appropriate price to burden our businesses with here in Australia? Probably the Greens. Well, I'm sure the Greens were behind. I mean, they, if you recall, they wanted a higher carbon tax price, yes. which I just think is outrageous. But there's more, Jeremy. Our company tax rate here in Australia is 30%. In China, it's 25%. Yeah. In Singapore, it's 17%. We simply can't compete. And people say, well, you know, businesses can afford it. They've got all this money. What's the problem? That is not the truth. The reality is, where does business get their revenue? From the man and woman on the street. And all the costs are passed on to us. And I think it's time for a you know, family first great name for a political party. I Thank think you. enough is enough. Yeah. Could be another political party. <laughs> well, I think that's right. I mean, look, minor parties are essentially protest parties. The Greens are essentially a protest yes. party about the environment. Yes. We are essentially a protest party about the way our society is heading. And we are overtaxed. We are over-regulated and the government wants to get in every square millimetre of our lives these yep. days. Yep. And you get to a point where local pavers can't compete with Chinese pavers. Yes, it's an absolute joke. The um, Weekend Australian, weekend just gone by on page 18, published a, a huge page, very, very small print. Very small print. And it's about the 900 places to see your tax dollars at work. And there are some extraordinary places that our money goes. I think the one that jumps out for me is the uh, Department of Climate Change. You know, the, the climate is going to change without a department. <laughs> we don't need a department. And what they certainly or can't... Or a commissioner. Indeed. And what they certainly can't do is stop it. And, and, and Jeremy, I think this point needs to be made. I mean, we've had... Uh, the Climate Change Commission make 
prediction after prediction after prediction. And all wrong. Uh, their, their record of success is appalling, yeah. frankly. It's appalling. The first thing government can do is abolish them. Why do we have them at all? I mean, there, there's a, 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 you know, a, a one-off saving you can make immediately. And, and on and on it goes. Why do governments want to get involved in every minutia of our lives? But this, this would, would make a grown man cry. Of course we are $260 billion in debt. Uh, in this country because if you look at how could we possibly support all of these departments they're not just departments they're filled with public servants yeah and, and Jeremy here in South Australia our state government now we're a small state obviously our state government pays something like 2.3 million dollars a day that's in interest in interest payments every single day 2.3 million dollars a day it's absolutely unsustainable what we are having the european disease as i call it to Man. some extent now europe has overspent overtaxed for you know the best part of a generation australia is now if not fully in that direction well and truly on the path to that direction there's a chance to stop it but it's now or never, it really is, and that's why I'm making the noise about these outrageous taxes and charges. Yeah. I was looking down here trying to find that, uh, that waiting room in Peary Street, you know, the Department of Redundant Public Servants, where yes. they go to work in the morning and uh, do nothing all day but have to be paid. You know, I mean, it's a joke. What about a redundancy package? Look, this is how you structure any business. We want to produce this service. We need this many people to do it. Yeah. If we have surplus people, we need to treat them well. We mm. need to give them redundancy payments, etc. But w we don't need your services anymore. We, ne we only need this amount of people. To have people employed at taxpayer expense to sit around doing literally nothing is offensive and wrong. Couldn't agree more. Dennis Hood, thank you for coming. That's my pleasure. Thank you. Great to see you. You too. Dorinda Hefner, wonderful, fascinating, eccentric lady. Up soon. The Court of Public Opinion, which I hope you're enjoying. It's the program that shoots the breeze, never the messenger. Happy birthday, if you're having a birthday. Yuri Gagarin was born on a collective in the Soviet Union. Uh, do you remember the name? He became the first man in space, launched in Vostok, that's the spaceship, Vostok, at uh, seven minutes past nine on the 12th of April, 61. You could buy a woman's weekly for four pennies. Four pennies. On this day in 1935, a patent for false teeth was granted to Charles M. Graham of New York City, 1822. And perhaps the most innovative and daring period of economic and social legislation in American politics, the New Deal, was introduced by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt on this day in um, 1933, just after the Depression. Um, also, the 27-year term of Liberal and Country League Premier Thomas Playford ended in South Australia with the election of a Labor government. L Labor leader Frank Walsh became uh, Premier, and that was in 1965. In 1562, which is going back a little bit further, kissing in public in Naples became punishable by death. Kissing in public became... Wonder, actually, <laughs> what in heaven's name would they think of the world today if they could drop in on us? Let me introduce you to Dorinda Hafner, who is, uh, can I say, a shadow of her former self, uh, still writing wonderful books and entertaining us all wonderfully. Welcome Jeremy. to the garage. Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> so you're still as naughty as ever. When I, when I asked you to come and uh, be on the show and I said, oh, by the way, it's in the garage, uh, what did you think? I thought you were joking. Yes. Well, no, uh, so I got here and I drove around looking for the garage and I drove past here. Yes. I thought, all those cars, it can't possibly be in there. Well, can you imagine uh, the architect uh, when, when, we, when we said, well, we'll put the cars down there and I want to create this place up here. And, oh, can you put an open fire in there? In the garage? Yes. And you did too. Well, I did. I, I hope you never liked it. Uh, oh yes, yes, yes. No, it's a working, uh, it's a working fire. Oh my job. But the the nice thing about it is that uh, you know how they have rules and regulations oh, yes. for absolutely everything, and That's there's a code. Right. Yes. And they went looking for a code for fireplaces in garages. And there is one. No. 
<laughs> no one has no one has been mad enough. A precedent. No precedent. Has been, a no. precedent has been set by you. Dorinda, how's your beautiful daughter? What's she doing now? She is in Melbourne. She's gone back to uni. She's doing masters in psychology. I see her sometimes on uh, the Sunrise program or yes, Channel Seven. Yes, she does. She fills in for uh, for them. Anytime somebody's off duty or has to go somewhere or is yeah. sick, they call her. And if it doesn't interfere with her lectures, then she'll go and do it. What? A, what? A, that must make you feel very, very proud because to get on television, most people want to do that. Yeah, I know. But now she's got it out of her system. A star <laughs> thing, bar. I'll so, be a, an academic. That's why what my children are both like that, though. They are very humble mm. kids, and they are not into this uh, uh, flighty number where everybody wants to be a star, that sort of stuff. They yeah. don't see themselves in, in that light. So Nula, as far as she's concerned, is a job, and she wants to do it with passion and do it well. But in the long term, she has to have substance behind her. Yeah, you've got to have and something to fall back that's on. That's right. She's yes. a lawyer. You know that, don't you? No, I didn't know that yeah, as well. Yeah. She's a trained lawyer. She trained here. Very clever mm. girl. And she was admitted to the bar, as they put it. Mm. And then um, she's uh, got arts degree as well. And um, she decided she wants to be a clinical psychologist. Why? Jeremy. Well, partly because probably half the world is going mad in desperate need of a psychologist. <laughs> now, you, <laughs> your, you, your cooking programs yes. are still going. Yes, all, all over the world. All over the world. 48 countries around the globe, yep, yep. If you live in, in the United States, you see me Thursdays, 8 to 9, on 300 PBS stations, I believe. And then Canada sees me, South Africa, uh, Brazil, um, oh, uh, where else? Um, <laughs> Caribbean, in somewhere in the Dutch Caribbean. Do you get and residuals and things? I wish. Oh, yes. Me, the thing is that when I started, I was very naive. I had no idea that it's going to go this well and for that long. And so I didn't sign a dotted line for residuals. But a I? proven personality like you and a successful worldwide product, uh, uh, thank uh, you and, very and, much. and every station seems to only want to produce cooking programs. I know. Why aren't you prime time Here cooking? in Australia? Yes. Have you not noticed? They don't want to produce television. They, that's right. It's funny, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. And now the, the people, a lot of the people who go on uh, don't want to be paid. They just want to be on telly. Yeah. Now, I see it as a job. I yes. have information to, to share with the public. I love what I do. I'm passionate. I have phenomenal experience and knowledge about food yeah. that I want to share. But I don't think that's what they want. They I want some kind of froth. Uh, uh, don't yes? I've given up trying to work out what it is <laughs> exactly that uh, they want. I have an idea. I think... Now, when you people who watch cooking shows, it's like watching porn. Right. Yes, they watch it, but they never practice it. <laughs> 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 That's my opinion. Only anyway. you doing a good thing is that. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You know, it's all very exciting and different, and you know, but they'll never practice. Now, oh, what about yeah. that one? Oh, do you know about this? <laughs> but I ask them to do it in their own kitchens. For a start, half of them don't have the gadgets, the modern gadgets. No, no, you no. Know? How many books have you written now? This is my eighth one. Gee, this one's called Honey. I shrunk, shrunk, <laughs> shrunk. <laughs> I have shrunk the Well, you have. You're a, a shadow, as I said I at the beginning, you, a shadow you before myself. We've known each other for many years. Yes. You knew me when I was, I couldn't, I couldn't get into this chair. Yes. And then you also knew me when I just barely fitted into a chair like this and couldn't move. Now, what did no. you do? What did you do? Ha-ha, good question. I had to get rid of diabetes. I was, di I was diagnosed with diabetes and high blood pressure. Mm. And I thought, oh, no, no, I don't need to hang on to this stuff. So to do it, I decided I don't believe in dieting. I'm a registered nursing sister and a very, very good cook. So why can't I put those expertise together and put together a healthy living program? Yes. And then I thought, exercise. I need eye candy. If you've got to exercise, you need somebody to turn you on. Watch your eye candy, you know. You're exercising. So You're I a very myself. foxy lady, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a realistic, a realist. You know, a realistic person. And I, I decided I'd get... Nathan, who's my personal trainer. Right. So I got Nathan, who's very good eye candy. I right. won't take any nonsense from me either. You know, he just will not take no for an answer. So I put together a healthy program. Right. And after I lost the first 35 kilos, my GP then sent me to Flinders to have a stomach banding. Ah, uh, gastric yes. banding. That's right. right. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. I went to uh, Prof Tooley at Flinders. And that unit there, I did bariatric center. My God, mm. I can't praise them enough, I tell you. The aftercase, see, anybody can lose weight. It's, Keeping it off and maintaining the momentum, yes, that yes, is the problem. Yes, it, because it does come back. The gastric banding basically restricts the amount of food that you get. Correct. You've got. So I, I, if we basically put less food on our plate... Hello. 
we'd be okay. But how many people do you know who do? Well, I was saying to somebody the other day that uh, half the world yes. was overweight yes. and the other half of the world was starving yes. and the other half, if there are three halves, uh, of the <laughs> world are making <laughs> cooking programs for Channel 10. <laughs> <laughs> and other places. That's right, that's right. But isn't that a shame that the world before more people died of starvation? Now people are dying of, of obesity. obesity. That yeah. is scary. Yep, yep. That really, we've got to reverse the, the trend, really, especially children. See, the dinner plates have got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Yes. And now what I'm doing is that I'm reducing the size of my cooking pots. I'm not into small cooking pots, and they're very cute, mm. Jeremy. But the important thing is they look cute, but they take two and a half or two and a quarter cups of food. Yeah. That's a lot of food when you put on a plate. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, that's the whole, that is the whole point. And I want uh, people to uh, uh, rethink the whole idea of eating, because every time you go on a diet, mm. you have a, a finite starting point and a finite finishing point. Yep. That means as soon as you finish, you go back. There is the book. <laughs> Look Honey, I shrunk the chef. I have shrunk her. <laughs> big time. Big time. Oh, I love She's you fitter. dearly. She's I love you dearly. And healthier. 80 nutritious and delicious calorie controlled recipes, all under 300 calories, yes. triple tested, medically endorsed. That's great. That really is wonderful. Another Easy. tribe for you. Thank you. Are you going to eat from my book? Uh, I'll eat from your book. Thank you. I do promise. Dorinda, bless you. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. The Court of Public Opinion. Coming up, Helen Hartley. Helen Hartley is a most interesting lady. She is a corporate astrologer. I can think of some fairly big companies that went belly up who could have probably used her in their earlier days. Speaking of birthdays and things, just quickly, Rupert Murdoch in this week is having a birthday, born 1931. Uh, well, that's interesting. The jury will find that interesting. Andrew Peacock became the leader of the Federal Liberal Party um, 1983 and the first daily newspaper in London it was called the Daily Courant published the Daily Courant C-O-U-R-A-N-T published for the first time uh, this week the anniversary going back to 1702 believe it or not now our jury uh, and you know a, a, a stunning jury Coralie Coralie Cheney Scott McBain. Odd one out. Odd? No! <laughs> no, stunning. great talent. I've never been called stunning before. And Caroline Peacock. <laughs> no, I think you look a great jury. Stop now, please. I'm yeah. <laughs> you know, if I was in the dock and I was about to be whatever they do, <laughs> I, I'd, I'd like to think that uh, the last thing I saw was a fine jury like you guys. I'd feel a lot yeah. better about my fate mm. in that case. Now, we went out on the streets and we asked some questions. The first one is... And I really like this because we were talking earlier about the uh, publication in the Weekend Australian. And this whole page, fine print, these are public servants. And we're going out onto the street to ask the people of Adelaide, do we have too many public servants? And this is what you say. In Australia, yes, we do. And we have uh, probably our fair share of public servants. And, um, which is probably a good thing sometimes, but uh, regarding what's happening at the moment with the way things are being run, um, I think there are probably too many and they're interfering with each other uh, in the sense of, uh, uh, you know, some of the decisions that are being made aren't necessarily the correct ones. Too many opinions sometimes, and those differing opinions hold things up. I think that with public servants it's more about making sure that the jobs are each defined properly so that you don't have too many people who have been just doing the same job for such a long time that they're not open to new ideas and then also not letting people become too institutionalised I guess um, and giving the, yeah, the new blood some way of, of getting in so they can make a difference. That's a tricky uh, question to answer because I'm one <laughs> so I work for the public service. Um, uh, in a medical sense um, so it's a tricky one to answer I, I'm not sure if I'm informed enough to give you a proper answer to that one I think if there's a, enough people doing the job uh, at, a, at an economical way then I think it's probably okay The question is not how many public servants we've got what services the government needs to provide to the community 
therefore you match that with your public servants numbers. To have an attitude of we must get rid of public servants or must reduce the numbers is the wrong question to ask. Is What services does the, the government intend to provide to the community and therefore you match your public servants to meet that needs and to help the governance of the state. It all depends you see if you're a public servant you're going to feel very differently about that question. Carly, too many public servants? The Not enough? Just about right? It's a tricky one. I mean, that's, that's just all different departments under departments. It's an incredible yes, amount of departments. And every department is crammed with public servants. True. But I know a few public servants who are very hardworking, dedicated people and do a wonderful job. Yes. I wouldn't want to criticise any public servant per se, but do we need to have each department justify itself? In other words, let's use transport for, exi for example. The transport department gets revenue from the transport, like re registration and, and fines and things like that, and that budget then has to be allowed for the things they need to do, which includes wages. So, you know, if in a business, if you are, you know, if you've got too many staff on or if your business isn't running well, you're going to have to cut back or find ways of making it more profitable. If each department was able to justify themselves, and I mean some of that money might have to come from the, the taxes overall, so they'd be allocated an amount, maybe they'd have to then work out whether they were overstaffed or not. In other words, you'd have to run it like, like a, a business. business. Which it should be a business. Like yeah. we would be running a business if you were, you know, this you, business, any you, business. Scott, um, when uh, Thomas Playford was the Premier. One of my favourite Premiers of all time, mm -hmm. of this state, right. I okay. have to admit. Now, he had a Premier's department that consisted of three people. Do you know how many are in there now? The st <laughs> state <laughs> Premier's I department. Well, I, I'm trying to think, and you know, I'm allowing for compounding interest and things like that, and I, it's going to scare me because you have an exact figure. 1,200 plus. 1,200 plus. You'd like to have an investment that returned that sort of... Mm. value, wouldn't you? Um, look, I, your, your idea about the, the each department being responsible or justifying their existence, I thought that's what the government was for, but uh, <laughs> apparently it's not, because depending on who's in power at the time, we see, uh, yes, we'll get rid of a few thousand, or no, we'll keep a few thousand. Then we would be in debt if, we were, if they were responsible, I, I just want to know what they do, first of all. That, that's that's one thing. Uh, I'm maybe showing my ignorance, but I, I'm not sure if I know any public. Well, they don't produce do. anything apart from red tape, do they? Uh, well, they'll create red tape. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, I looked at the Australian Bureau of sorry, Bureau of Statistic figures, mm. and they said in nine, uh, 2008, 16% of the population were public servants. Wow. And if you can 16 percent. Which is absolutely mind-boggling. That's election-winning figures, isn't it? And that was it? 2008. Yeah, yeah. And since then, I'm sure, under progressive Labor governments, we, that has increased. Yeah, but you reach a point where even if you want to revolutionise the thing and you go to the people and you say, we are going to get rid of 20,000 public servants, you will probably be kicked out of your leadership role, as Isabel Redmond was. Uh, not perhaps over that. Mm. But the, the bottom line is that your public service will reach a point where it is bigger than you are as a government and oh. they will call the tune. I think it may well have reached that position. Yeah, well... You think if you, t if you take that many public servants out of the equation and there's an election coming up, there's a very good chance that you could lose an election based on that percentage of people. Totally. Um, how it would affect the overall vote. Damn. Oh. Um, now, uh, the closing. See? Well, and you, and you would have to, and that's a good point, because you would almost need to pinpoint demographically, or socio-economic yeah. demographics, a, as to where they were in relation to marginal seats and go, no, no look, your job's safe because <laughs> you're in seat X, Y, Z. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, uh, it, it, is, it is a bit scary. I understand that we need to have people in those positions. I, as I said, I, I would just like to know a little more about what it is they do. It reminds me of, a, of an old gag that you would remember about the memo that went out to all of the public servants saying that they weren't allowed to look out of the window before midday, otherwise they'd have nothing to do after midday. <laughs> These right. days, of course, it would be an email or a text. <laughs> all right, if you could get them away from social media long enough to actually do some work. Um, now, this is something that I find fascinating. Do you think 
charities should be more publicly accountable for the money they collect. I mean, should they have to perhaps say, um, out of every dollar you give me for the charity, 10 cents, 20 cents, 50 cents will go to administration. But we as the giver, wouldn't we have a right to know that? Well, I, I, I guess I, I have to show my hand here straight up, um, as do you. We both have uh, a long involvement with Variety, the children's yes, charity. Yes. Uh, a long and proud involvement. Yeah. I, uh, you're a, a life member. Yeah. Uh, I'm an ambassador um, for 1075 Variety SA. Yeah. But I've they had, make a big point of the we, fact. We do, and, I, I, and that, that was my next point. I think probably one of the most comforting things uh, and for me, being involved, apart from the fact that it's an amazing organisation with fantastic people that, that does a lot of good, we are completely transparent and always have been to the point where every year we, uh, we actually um, issue a completely independently audited set of figures so that anybody in the public can receive our, our brochure, which we're very, very proud of, yeah. and it will show down to the last cent where the grants that we've given over the previous financial year have gone to the last cent. Now that can be fitting out a, a raw flying doctor plane, for example, or, or putting in a, a, a swimming yeah. pool at the this bottom is of the good, women's children's. This is or, good governance. This is you know? transparency. But yeah. the others could be accused of running a business, not a charity. Caroline? Well, and it's not just that, because some of the charities are very worthwhile, but they rely on telemarketers to do their mm. fund running. And I think if you get a call from someone purporting to be raising money for that particular charity and you want to give them money, don't give it to them over the phone. Send them a cheque directly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think Variety is probably one of the better charities from my understanding. And as you know, Jeremy, I worked in philanthropy in that area there many years ago for quite some time and have dealt with pretty much all the charities in South Australia at some point. And I remember speaking to Ran about this many years ago and about how we could possibly or potentially put charities under umbrellas. As in, for example, I, th I think there's about 50 different cancer charities. Could they come under one umbrella of, of cancer and thus alleviate all those rents, administrations, wages, etc., under one umbrella? All donations for cancer go into that and then distributed. But the problem with that was, according to what Mike Rand was saying, was that everybody has their own beef, let's say. And let's use, um, is it McGrath, whose wife died of cancer, breast cancer? Yeah. Glenn McGrath, the mm. cricketer, mm -hmm. um, as an example. So if you have someone you love or close to that you know, has, has had an issue, whether it's from a spider bite for, you know, right through to cancer or something, you want to set up a foundation that is to raise funds to help prevent or help cure or whatever, alleviate the problem, then you're entitled to do that. Now, that opens it up to just about anyone, whether it's animals, children, um, cancer, whatever, uh, this, this huge amount of charities out there, which does cost a lot of money to run. Yes. And whilst Variety is one of those very good ones, where I think they work on about 70%. Oh, no, oh, no, 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 we, we've never, it was we've seven cents in the dollar yeah, we went yes. to administration. We've, we've, okay, never so we've never exceeded 10 cents in the dollar. And in a way, yeah. Yeah. In a way Variety operates like an umbrella because well, we Variety are, hands yeah. out to all the other children's we are, charities. We are an umbrella charity, that's exactly but right. But what, I mean, this, what about this business of, of uh, CEOs who are paid between 150 and 180, 190 thousand dollars a year? Now, if you're working for a charity, wouldn't you be a little bit more, well, a little less businesslike and a little more philanthropic? I, I look. I suppose the issue is it, it's paying peanuts, getting monkeys. Mm. Uh, to, to put it bluntly, uh, as such, I mean, you you either get somebody who is in a financial position that they can afford to take that cut from being in the, the corporate world and, and, and yes. move into the not-for-profit world. Um, but you still need somebody at the helm who, who, business who business. has business savvy. Mm -hmm. and, and what's more, I, I think we're finding that the trend is that you need younger people because you need to be attracting younger people to those organisations. Yeah. So consequently, if you've got somebody who's on the way up the corporate ladder, I mean, it, it is a tough one. But the, the other thing that concerns me is that it seems to be a bit of a trend at the moment that, oh, I'm going to have my own foundation. 
Yes, there are a lot you of know, them. And, 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 and there are know, a lot of them. There are some individuals who are financially able to, to do that, but there are some who run businesses that just seem to want to yep. do it because it's the, well, just, that's what just, the cool kids are doing. Just tell me how much money is going to the cause uh, and how much is going to administration. And, and, and be transparent in that. But I see another trend too because you get... Uh, uh, well, I bet not. I bet not name them, but they come out and they say um, a percentage yeah. uh, of every dollar uh, that you spend will go to the such and such. Now, mm. what percentage? Yeah. Mm. You should be forced mm. to say mm. we will give ten percent of every sale to such and such a charity. Well, so if you, it doesn't if, happen. If you made a TV commercial and made a claim like that, Free TV Australia, who who actually yeah. govern what goes on TV, would say, no, well, you've got to be specific because that is a very, very broad statement to make. OK, here's what the people of Adelaide think. I think so. I think they should be more accountable and more sensible to where the money goes um, because we don't know much about each charity as such. We don't give enough information where they go and what they do and you only get these little ads on TV that say that go to certain places and that and you don't get the full stink to where all the money goes and you should be able to know where the money goes as such, where, if it's going to the right people or going to the right community or doing the right service for people in need, yeah? Yeah, I think that's a hot topic. Um, they still do a lot of work with charities and you know, my sort of belief is that um, to, to successfully run a charity you need administrative money like any other successful business so you know I don't like to see this conversation about you know CEOs of Red Cross getting paid too much because I think at the end of the day if you want to run a, a serious charity you need to pay someone serious money to run it um, but at the end of the day it is about transparency. Definitely I'm tired of walking uh, through corners not being able to cross the road without someone trying to get me to sell uh, trying to get me to part with my money with it for their charity uh, especially in Sydney and Brisbane, places like that in particular, just different charity that you can't. I didn't realise that they um, that so little money from the money that we give them actually goes to the charity. Definitely. I'm sure they should be because there's been a number of occasions where charities of people collecting or running charities have used up money on themselves rather than the purpose they designed uh, they work for. Uh, a lot of the money doesn't go to where you think it's going and so I think um, they should be very upfront with what goes where so that people know when they donate how much is actually going to what they had thought it was. Yeah. Hmm. Now I've uh, run out of time. I mean the jury, I, we got two questions because I, mm. we, you know, sorry about that. But there is another question which we will hold over till next week about animal experimentation and the idea that animals uh, for our comfort and uh, for our safety are put through really awful, uh, painful experiences. And uh, animal experimentation, I think, is something that in the court of public opinion uh, we need to discuss. So we'll, we'll do that next week. By the way, I, I should have mentioned when I was talking to Narinda about this uh, eccentric garage, come studio, come man cave, come whatever, uh, that if, um, it was uh, Pauline Huron who, who uh, had to come up with the design for what I suppose the builder and the council and everyone else must have thought was rather eccentric. But anyway, let me tell you about this. Um, it's called Total Lemons. 111 heroic failures of motoring and this ties in very very well with Helen Hartley who's my next guest because you know all of these people didn't set out to fail you know I mean there's the there's a whole chapter on the uh, Ford Etzel which sort of never made it anywhere except into the uh, the uh, um, horrible book of shame in motoring uh, there's a Lagonda even that was a, a mess, a Volvo 262C. Uh, they don't like that. They, I had one of those years and years ago. I thought it was fine. The Mini Moke gets into this 
Total Lemons Book of Motoring. The Mini Moke was a wonderful little car. Kind of like a Jeep and kind of like a, I don't know. The Leyland P76 of course gets a Guernsey. If you collect cars or you're interested in cars, you should get this little book. It's only a paperback, ABC Books. Uh, and there are some, that is a, um, um, a light burn, by the way. You know the people who made the washing machines? That's, that's a light burn. Makes the cover. Let me introduce you to Helen Hartley, who is a corporate astrologer. So if you're going to start a business, you'd want to know how it was going to turn out in the end. Hi, Helen. Hi, how are you? I hope you're not implying that business astrology is a bit of a lemon. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that uh, if you were designing something, be it a business or a car or, or yep. even a television program, yes. you'd, 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 and, and you had a, an eye for astrology and things metaphysical, you'd check it out, wouldn't you? Well, you absolutely would because... You know, if we, if we assume that everything is energy, yeah. um, then a business will have an energy. And what we do in business astrology is we take natal astrology, but we interpret it in a different sort of way. So um, we look at it through the lens of business. And we look at things like strategic planning, recruitment, how they do their finances and all that sort of stuff, how they treat their employees, where the problems are yeah. in the business. And, and it can be actually really quite beneficial because I think it's great efficient use of resources rather than kind of puddling around and not really knowing where you're going. But where, where does it start from? It is the, the day you were incorporated, uh, the day you opened the doors? It's a great question because if you have the moment of incorporation, that can be useful. However, typically, when you either register a business or you incorporate as a proprietary limited, you're doing lots of behind the scenes work. So you don't open your doors to the public at that point. So we do, we look at that and then most importantly, we look at the first time you open your doors to the public. Yeah. So that becomes the, the, the key to the whole thing. And, and then we look at, at that as a birth yes. and we look at the patterns and the relationships that occur within the circle called the horoscope yes. and we kind of make some determination about that. And some of these hard-nosed business people yep. uh, are susceptible to this? Yes, but they wouldn't tell you. Right. Yeah, look, they wouldn't tell you, particularly within Western culture, because that's not yeah. something that is commonplace within our culture. Yet it's interesting that a number of my clients are, qu are professional people and yes. they have a curiosity. I often uh, start off by saying, if you were going to spend a million bucks on advertising, wouldn't you like to know when is a better time to do it? So, for example, up in the sky right now, we have Mercury retrograde. Mercury rules communication. And if you were spending money on an advertising and marketing program, right now it probably wouldn't go so well. Right, but you, uh, you'd have to find some way of wrapping all that up because you'd, you'd, they're in front of the board of directors and you said, well, we're not going, we're going to hold off on this advertising campaign because uh, 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 Mercury is in retro, <laughs> did you say? <laughs> Retrograde, You yes, know, you'd, yeah, you'd yes. find yourself in the mail room. Oh, look, they would think you're absolutely nuts and they'd be trolling in all the psychologists and putting you on the EAP program. But the interesting thing is the people that talk to me would go back to their senior management teams or their senior managers themselves. Yeah. Or they would go back to the board and they would find rational, logical, good business reasons not to actually act. So mm. I don't think they go in and front up and say, look, the business astrologer said this would not be a good time to do this. I think they use a different dialogue. Yes. So um, it, it's still yeah. pretty much under the, under the carpet. Yeah. yeah, but it would make sense, wouldn't it, to get as much intelligence uh, that you possibly can. You might not take it all on board, exactly. but you would just sort of scan it and have it as considered. Absolutely, because in business, and I've operated as a senior corporate executive, in business you, you do that sort of thing. You don't take on board every piece of advice or every piece of information. But, you know, market intelligence can be a really useful thing to have. Yeah. By way of example, you know, Microsoft, when you have a look at Microsoft's horoscope, um, when they're such a successful company and when you look at the time that they went uh, launched their IPO, we just wonder whether secretly they had a ho uh, an astrologer actually set it up because it's, it's sort of, not that there's a, such thing as a perfect horoscope, but God, it's damn good. Yeah. And look how successful they've been. 
Conversely, look at some of the huge corporate collapses. I know. Ah, the, the uh, heroic failures. Heroic failures. And, you know, I can think of two Australian ones. And one is HIH yes. with Rodney Adler. Yeah. One Tell was a pretty big one. One Tell was a pretty big one as well. <laughs> and, of course, a, a more recent one was ABC, child mm. care centres. Yes. And what was interesting with each of those was we not only looked at the horoscope of the corporation, but we looked at the horoscope of the leaders. Now, Rodney Adler, he was in... Um, what astrologers call the Uranus opposition, Uranus time of his life, which meant everything could go belly up depending on how he had acted previously. Um, similarly with the gentleman from um, ABC. Mm. So they are caught up within their own mm. cycles. Eddie, and what was his name? Groves? Eddie Groves. Eddie Groves, Thank Groves you. Yeah. yeah, Eddie Groves. So they were caught up within their own cycles, but of course, because they're the leaders, they significantly influence the horoscope of the corporation. Now, now Helen asked me uh, when we put the first program to air or when we recorded the first program yeah. of the Court of Public Opinion. Yeah. So I take it you... Um, have the horoscope? Do you want me to show you? Do you this? want good news or bad news? <laughs> <laughs> For those of you that haven't ever seen a horoscope, yeah. that's, that's kind of what it looks like. It's a circle and it's divided into pie slices. And um, we call those things houses, and the houses represent departments of the business. Looks a bit like a minefield. Well, it, you know what, and it can be, but we hope that we can walk you through that and get you through safely. And a business, like any entity, it, it, it starts, it evolves, it's impacted by market conditions, um, and it has a kind of life of its own. So if I have a look at... Give me a, just give me a summary. What give do you, you think? Give a summary. Well, I think that it's really interesting. And the other part that probably is worth mentioning is... We have to end it there. We're not going to... I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> while you're ahead. <laughs> well, what is, what is also interesting is that um, often when the business goes, in your case, goes to air, it happens, coincidentally enough, to reflect what it is that you're doing. And you're in the business of communication. So you do have a very strong communication theme within this business, which means that those three times a year that Mercury goes retrograde, um, and I can give you those dates uh, when we go off air, um, are very important to you because things will get kind of screwed up, things will become confused, equipment breaks down, you know, you try and get things to air Sounds and it won't go Sounds perfectly to air. normal. Sounds like just every, every week. <laughs> every week. But sometimes the treacle's thicker than others that you've got to swim but, through. But generally speaking, um, you see... Don't, don't look at me like that. <laughs> you know... What do I see? What do you see? Basically... Because we're getting wound up, so we have to go. Oh, okay, we're getting wound up. All righty. Communication, good thing. Finances will fluctuate more than any other businesses. I think um, the court of public opinion is going to be slow but steady. So the growth needs to be slow but steady. I think sales and marketing, whoever runs the marketing probably does it with a fair bit of precision and doesn't necessarily want to spend the money. Well, you've heard of a low budget program, yeah. haven't you? Yeah, well, this is a no budget This is a no budget, budget program. program. Yep, figured that. Um, but slow and steady wins the race. Hmm. The really interesting thing is that probably around May next year, Year, can't help but wonder if the Court of Public Opinion is going to do a lot of expanding and even rebranding. So there's mm. going to be some tweaking that will actually occur and, um, you know, th that will, how you rebrand that or how you tweak it will depend on your strategic plan, where it is you want to go, how it fits into the markets. So I've just given you a sentence that's fairly stock standard in business point of difference with using an astrology is the timing. Okay, now if you're in business and you want to have your astrology chart checked, have you, have you got a website? or a, I have, a, yes. A, um, what do people go to? www.astrologymatters.com or else they can contact me at helen at astrologymatters.com. Helen Hartley, mm -hmm. thanks for coming in. My thanks to Hair Artistique, Tailors of Distinction and Tailors Wines and all our supporters and of course all our viewers now in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Perth and of course beloved Adelaide. Um, Hi. You have a guest, <laughs> Betty. I found Christopher outside. 
just <laughs> roaming your beautiful outside your beautiful rainforest. Well, people are going to think it's rather nepotistic, you know, sort of. Well, but my son, my son, <laughs> my youngest son, Christopher. The reason I, I grabbed him to come in here today is because he told me he went to see Oz, the Great and Powerful. So I want to ask him a couple of questions about that. Yeah, okay. Because it was a, a terrific movie. And uh, speaking of kids' movies, have you heard of Jack the Giant Slayer? Yes. That's another movie I went to see on the weekend. You know what that's about? Uh, it's the basic. It's based on the beloved story of Jack and the Beanstalk. That's right. But this one is more of, of a war. Or well, it, it's just a little bit more. There's a little bit more action in it. There's big giants in it. There's yeah. great special effects. I absolutely loved. It. I took my two nephews to see this. Great for the kids, right? Mm. Um, look, it, it has um, a rating of, of violence, but I don't think it's as violent as. You know, people think. Well, most kids are violent. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, what did you think of Oz? What did yeah. you think of Oz? Yeah. Well, I thought the effects were brilliant, especially mm. since it was from the creators that brought us the Spider-Man trilogy. He the um, the trilogy of oh no, um, Avatar and and Alice in Wonderland, mm. and the cast were brilliant and. It was full of celebs, and the story took place as in the land that everyone knew who, no matter when they were born, Oz. Oz. That's right, because everyone's seen The Wizard of Oz. So yes. this is before The this Wizard of Oz? Prequel. or how? prequel. Oh, I see. A prequel? Yeah. yeah, the movie before. When I was your age, I wouldn't have been able to <laughs> say prequel, let alone know what it meant. It's how the wizard became the wizard. The wizard. Yes. Okay. And did you think he was a nice person? Yes, uh, at first you learned that he's a bit of a trickster. A trickster? I thought yeah. he was a bit of a womanizer, actually. But Could anyway, be the same thing. Yeah, yeah. trickster, you're tricking everybody, that's right, and then? Yeah, but um, as he got into the tornado, uh, he thought he was going to die, so he made a pact to change his ways, and <laughs> therefore he became the nice man of Oz. That's right. I think it's great. I would love yeah. Christopher to see a lot more kids movies and, oh, well, and he can be our uh, roving I think kids movie reporter fantastic because it's great to hear what kids think of it i mean the parents always yeah, have their yeah. opinions yeah yeah oh, good that's on good you, christopher well we'll have to see you to get jack the giant slayer great movie great special effects with jack the giant Slayer. opens in a couple of weeks so we'll see what happens there what do you think and did you bump into scott McBain? because i loved it it reminded me of our old 5ka days well when i first met you it was at ka and scott McBain was there and that's and, uh, right uh, the rest Blakey was there too, I think? No, Blakey was there later. Oh, I, I see, okay. Yeah, the, when I wasn't there when Blakey was there. Was it, you, you were with Ian McRae I was when he was Ian McRae, I was with Macker yes. and the Fox. Yeah. That's right. Macker and the Fox. Do you remember? Oh, I do indeed. They were the days. They back were when, the days. Back when men were men and movies really moved. And, and i tell you what song reminds me of the 5KA days is um, Paul Simon's Diamonds on the Soles of Her Shoes. Right. And speaking of Paul Simon, he's actually touring Australia. Great. Yeah, so he's Can you use your influence and get him into the garage? Well, when is he here? He's in Adelaide on Tuesday the 2nd of April. Do you, think we might be, <laughs> do you think we might be able to get him to stay for one more day or two more days to get him in on a Thursday? You never know. Why not? If anyone can do it, I think you can we do can it. try. Now, Christopher, have you been to the Garden of Unearthly Delights yet? Uh, no, I have to admit, I haven't. Do you, have, you want to go? Uh, I would love to. Okay, well, we've got another, what, four or five days where it finishes on Sunday. The Fringe. Speaking of the Fringe, you know the festivals that we have here in Adelaide? Yeah, Mad you, March. Yeah, it is. It's insane. Hmm. Do you know how much money it brings into the economy? I found this the other day that Patrick McDonald wrote um, in the uh, advertiser, Love hmm. Patrick. Hmm. He always writes the best things, of course, <laughs> about interesting things that I like to read about. And it's always about money that comes into the SA economy because yeah. I always, always think that sometimes, you know, money is not spent properly, but it is when it comes to the festivals. I see you're really excited about our festivals, Jeremy. Tell us, well... Yeah. No, as, I, as everyone knows, I don't get out very often. <laughs> you don't. Well, anyway, um, a new study found that visitors last year spent 30, uh, sorry, 58.1 million, I don't have my glasses on. 58.1 million, excluding ticket sales, right. and uh, generated a total of 62.9 million in new income for the state economy. And the to total number of people who attended the festival last year was 2.82 million. So the total economic benefit to South Australia is 62.9 million. Hmm. How great is that? 
Well, it's, it, it, that, that goes to restaurants, it goes to uh, taxi drivers. Everywhere. Well, oh, the total okay. number well, that's visited wonderful. nights spent in the state yep. uh, was uh, six nights per person. So that's hotels that's and hotels. bars and restaurants. Jobs, 790 were created. So even the locals are benefiting. Oh, no, no, I, I, I admit it. I think it's, it's, uh, it's wonderfully worthwhile. Uh, the whole place comes alive. Well, you will be taking Christopher to the garden because you want to go, don't you? No, he'll go with you. <laughs> Do you want to go with Caroline? He'll lead me astray. Yeah. No, I think you should come too because I, I oh, really think you need to check right. the garden out. Betty, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. See you both in the garden of, what was it? Unearthly delight. <laughs> <laughs> I should have known. That's right. I should have known. Uh, thanks to Peter Sellen at the Animal Welfare League, we do have our pet of the week. Uh, it says, I'll read it off the phone and you can perhaps have a little look at it on the screen. Um, my name is Patchy. Um, a nine month old Border Collie Doberman Cross. I'm a clever, friendly, outgoing, energetic dog that would, be, would respond well to training. Sometimes I can be a bit boisterous. <laughs> I love the way the Animal Welfare League writes these things up. Sometimes I can be a bit boisterous. That means I'll wreck the house. Um, so I would be best suited to a family without small children. I am very active and I need lots of exercise. If you have an active lifestyle and want me to be part of it, then we would be a very good match. Microchipped, desexed, vaccinated, health checked. I'm yours for $310. And you can see me at the Animal Welfare League, uh, 1 to 19 Cormac Road at Wingfield. And you can ring them on 8348 Double O. It's amazing what you can do on a telephone, isn't it? The Court of Public Opinion is my registered trademark. Have a wonderful week. Thank you for watching and goodbye from all of us. Hey, so nice to meet you. Did you dream of me? So, well, fancy that. So, what you doing Friday?